Okay, in this video we're going to go through some details of the excitation contraction coupling process for skeletal muscle. So hopefully you've already watched the first video from A&P Flix that showed an overview of the process and now we'll just add a few more details of it um, in this video. So here we have the axon terminal of a somatic motor neuron and here we have a piece of muscle. We have the sarcolemma or the plasma membrane of the muscle with the T tubules going deep into the muscle. The SR is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which of course stores the calcium inside the muscle. And then we have our contractile fibers. We have our thick filaments, which are the myosin with the cross bridges, and then the thin filaments, which are actin. A couple of things to note. It's important to keep track of your fluid compartments to understand the direction of ion flow. So in here, and in here too, is the intracellular fluid or ICF, and then of course outside is the interstitial fluid. But note that because the T-tubules are continuous with the outside of the cell, that the T-tubules themselves are filled with interstitial fluid. Okay, so now that we're oriented to where we are on this um, drawing, let's follow an action potential coming down from one of these motor neurons that originated in the spinal cord. So we have our action potential coming down the axon, which you can imagine is there, and moving down the axon terminal. So there's some little channels drawn on here with arrows in them, and there's a shaded channel and a white channel and of course one is going to be a voltage gated sodium channel and one is a voltage gated potassium channel and hopefully by now you figured out we're not memorizing symbol colors or shapes but it's important to understand that the direction of ion flow is a big clue to what kind of channel it is so if ions are flowing in to the intracellular fluid when you open the channel then we know that that's a voltage gated sodium channel and in channels where the ions are flowing out, such as this one here, so this dark shaded one, it's going to be a voltage gated potassium channel. So of course we've got our sequence of opening and closing of voltage gated sodium and potassium channels causing our rapid depolarization and repolarization sequence all the way down the axon to the axon terminal and then we open voltage gated calcium channels in the axon terminal. So, so far in our description of the excitation contraction coupling for skeletal muscle we haven't said anything that you guys don't already know from your study of neurons. So these are vesicles of neurotransmitter and the neurotransmitter for motor neurons is acetylcholine. So entry of calcium causes exocytosis of acetylcholine into the synapse that we call the neuromuscular junction. And then the acetylcholine is going to bind with an acetylcholine gated sodium channel right here. So this is an ACH gated sodium channel, or more general terms, we would call it a ligand gated sodium channel. So sodium will enter the cytosol and cause a graded potential. So I'm going to write GP right here. Well, once that membrane reaches threshold, then because we've got voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels all along the sarcolemma, we can start an action potential. So we have sodium entering and potassium leaving. And I'm not going to draw that on there, but you can if you want to. So we have an action potential and an action potential moving across the sarcolemma. And that action potential is going to go down the T-tubules because as long as you have voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels, then you have, those are not very good arrows, but you guys get the point, we have an action potential moving down there. So what happens next? Well, we have, and again, these channels are not really drawn in the right place. They're really kind of more along these cisternal uh, terminal cisternae here, but 
we have a special kind of um, voltage gated protein that's linked to um, a calcium channel so I could kind of draw that in the membrane here so this is a voltage sensitive protein that's kind of mechanically linked by proteins to another calcium channel and when this change in vo uh, voltage arrives it changes the shape of this protein and causes release of calcium into the cytosol so we're calling this a voltage gated calcium channel but just keep in mind that it's really a combination of a voltage sensitive protein that changes shape and then pulls kind of a mechanically gated calcium channel open so the calcium levels go up in the cytosol notice that we have some other proteins in the membrane here with arrows showing inward movement and these are a calcium ATPase because in order to stop the muscle contraction we have to put the calcium away so as the action potential comes down the t-tubules and causes the release of calcium calcium binds with troponin which is a regulatory protein associated with actin um, and that causes contraction of the muscle as troponin um, pulls tropomyosin out of the way of the myosin binding site on actin and that's in the next video but in order for the muscle to relax again the calcium all has to be put away and so the calcium ATPase uses active transport uses lots of ATP to pump the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum again another way of terminating the signal happens up in the synapse here so we've got another little symbol up here which is an enzyme which you may already know about let me put an arrow wiggling out to this enzyme and that's an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase let me just draw that acetylcholinesterase so as you can imagine, the ASE at the end suggests it's an enzyme, and it is. And it's an enzyme that breaks down the acetylcholine. So the only way to keep opening these ligand-gated sodium channels is for this axon terminal to keep releasing acetylcholine. And once it's bound with the um, receptor, the acetylcholine-gated sodium channel, um, and then it's broken down by the acetylcholinesterase and the signal stops. So this allows fine control over motor movement. So upper motor neurons from the brain tell the lower motor neurons, which these are coming from the spinal cord, to um, release, cause action potentials, release acetylcholine and cause the muscle to contract. But once the um, signal stops, then the acetylcholine is broken down and the calcium ATPase of course is always working so you have to let it out faster than you put it away. So you've got two mechanisms to terminate the signal here. And of course if anything interferes with breaking down of acetylcholine or interferes with any of these proteins involved in the process then we interfere with muscle contraction and we can have two ways of interfering with it we can keep a muscle contracted so if you have um, a drug or toxin that blocks acetylcholinesterase then you keep acetylcholine in the synapse longer and the muscle keeps contracting and that's called tetanic paralysis you guys have all heard of tetanus before where your muscles stay um, contracted. Or if you had a toxin, for example, that prevented um, the release of acetylcholine, for example, then the muscles wouldn't be able to contract at all, and we call that flaccid paralysis. So we'll talk in class about different um, types of toxins or diseases that influence the ability of muscle to contract. What you guys need to understand is how each of these proteins, so when we're talking about proteins we're talking about channels and we're talking about receptors, um, how each of these functions in the process of excitation contraction coupling. So if we said, well a toxin blocks these voltage gated sodium channels on the sarcolemma, you guys will know what the consequence of that is. Okay, so use your notes template. Draw this over and over again until you can reproduce this without looking at your notes, and then you will know what you need to know about excitation contraction coupling in skeletal muscle.